Now the next speaker to speak to you will be Professor Jerry Jill and he will be speaking to you for a period of 20 minutes. Excellency, Mr. Attorney General, General and Flag Officers, Mr. Vice Chancellor, Mr. Dean of the Faculty, Ambassador Pinto, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be invited as the first Moragoda Trust visiting professor to the Sir John Kotalawala Defense University and appear before such a distinguished audience. The Moragoda Trust, established by Ambassador Dr. Pinto, has initiated this revolving chair in international law to bring foreign scholars to your country, and I am deeply honored to be the first such visiting professor amongst you. I'm very thankful for the warm hospitality shown to me by all the representatives of the Trust and KDU, and I must say it is a real pleasure to visit your country for the first time and be invited to offer this presentation to you. My presentation is entitled The Universality and Current Challenges to International Humanitarian Law and will be divided into two parts with a short conclusion. I will first address the basic values and ethical standards found in all major world cultures which are reflected in international humanitarian law and then go on to say how IHL has developed into one of the most heavily codified subsystems within the system of international law and how it has expanded its reach of protection in recent years. I will then turn to outline a number of the most pressing challenges to the current legal framework and give some ideas on how to address these challenges. I will close with a few concluding remarks. The universality of human, international humanitarian law is a point that is, I would say, beyond discussion. Uh, international humanitarian law, or the law of war, as it is referred to for many centuries, is one of the oldest branches of international law. It can trace its origins back to antiquity and reflects a number of basic ethical principles which can be found in the cultural traditions of virtually all peoples. It is based on a number of fundamental principles which attempt to strike a balance between the basic purpose of any war, which is to achieve one's objectives by the force of arms, and, on the other hand, the dictates of the public conscience and of humanity, to paraphrase the famous Martin's Clause, by sparing as much as possible the civilian population and preventing unnecessary suffering or wanton destruction and providing humane and honorable treatment to persons who are captured or in the power of an adversary. Of course, notions of chivalry and ethics have, and what is humane and humanitarian, have evolved over the centuries. But these traditions have shown a long, as it were, continuity over a long period of time. And they have formed the foundation for the law of war and are reflected in the warrior ethics of virtually all peoples from ancient through medieval times up until early modern age. From the 18th century, it evolved into a corpus of customary international law, which was first codified in the 19th century by the famous German-American professor Francis Lieber at the behest of President Abraham Lincoln. A few examples will have to suffice to illustrate these points and the universality of the values expressed in the laws of war. Martial honor and notions of chivalry are one of the chief inspirations and antecedents of modern international humanitarian law. As I said, these notions have been central to warrior ethics for as long as warfare has existed and are reflected in the people in the traditions of the ancient Near East, India, China, Japan, and ancient Western civilizations. All of these cultures honored bravery on the battlefield, required warriors to spare defeated combatants who had laid down their arms and asked for quarter, and honor the fallen on both sides. This is illustrated by the battlefield practice of armies all over the world throughout the ages. Alexander of Macedon, considered widely considered one of the greatest commanders in history, in, uh, is known for the fact that after battles he would uh, erect fu funeral pyres and honor the dead of both sides uh, uh, before moving on to, uh, to his next campaign. This same practice was engaged in Sri Lanka 
by your own king, and I apologize if I pronounce it incorrectly, Dutugumenu, who after having defeated the Indian prince Ilara around 160 before the Christian era, ordained that henceforth honor would be paid to his place of burial, and it is carried over this practice into modern times, as can be illustrated by the example of the conduct of the German commander at Saint-Nazaire in World War II, who after a daring British commando raid in 1942, which succeeded in its military objective of destroying its, some docks uh, intended for a German battleship, but it cost most of the raiding party their lives or captivity. In view of the bravery and the honorable way in which the troops had fought, the German commander ordered an honor guard mounted over the graves of the fallen and buried them with full military honor. So we have a long continuity in these type of traditions. These traditions of chivalry have alongside increasing attention for the civilian population as a result of the evolution of warfare and the destructiveness of modern weapons emerged into a global network of treaty and customary law, which form a, a comprehensive body of legal protection. The four Geneva Conventions of 1949 are the most widely ratified conventions in the world uh, alongside the United Nations Charter, with virtually all states, members of the international community parties to them. The Hague Regulations on Land Warfare of 1907, already considered customary law by the Nuremberg Tribunal of 1945, has long emerged as a, core a set of core principles on which other uh, treaties have built. The treaties on specific weapons, such as the Biological Weapons Convention, the Convention Banning Chemical Weapons, and the Conventional Weapons Convention, and its uh, different protocols are also widely, if not perhaps quite as universally adhered to. And last but not least, of course, the additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions of 1977 indeed are a very widely uh, ratified source of legal obligation, and many of their provisions constitute customary international law. Now, turning to customary law, that has always been one of the primary sources of IHL, but it has been, as it were, to a certain extent, rediscovered recently. The International Committee of the Red Cross, Red Crescent, ICRC, conducted a long and thorough study of the development of customary IHL, lasting quite a few years and involving a large number of very eminent scholars and practitioners, and identified 161 rules of international humanitarian law which are applicable in international armed conflicts between states. Uh, 140 of those would apply to non-international conflicts within states. Now that has greatly uh, expanded the reach of protection of international humanitarian law to the most prevalent form of conflict today, namely internal armed conflicts, since the treaty provisions relating to internal armed conflicts are limited. Now I will turn to some of the current challenges facing international humanitarian law. International humanitarian law, like any other branch of law, has often violated, and neither notions of chivalry nor humanitarian considerations have been able to prevent suffering caused by warfare, even when the rules are adhered to. Indeed, some of the bloodiest battles in history were fought strictly in accordance with the rules which existed at the time. For instance, the Battle of Gettysburg or the Battle of Waterloo were fought in accordance with the then existing IHL, but cost tens of thousands of casualties on the battlefield. All laws are violated on a regular basis. That is a basic premise of any legal system. Otherwise, the whole existence of systems of punishment, criminal justice, police forces, prisons, fines, sy systems of state responsibility and reparation and so forth would be superfluous. So, if we acknowledge that in peacetime, in even the most orderly and well-governed of societies, that laws are violated on a regular basis, it should come as no surprise that under the extreme duress and pressures of armed conflict that they are also violated. Now that is not an excuse for their violation, but it should be an answer to those pessimists and cynics who say, well, what use is the law if it is violated on a regular basis? The answer to that is, of course, not only is it violated, but is it also adhered to. The exception to the rule is not, in fact, the rule itself. So if we acknowledge that every system of law is based on the imperfection of humanity, since we, it is a human construct, and that it will inevitably always be violated, we 
mustn't nevertheless turn our backs to the necessity of moving forward in uh, response to those challenges. Huge strides have been made in extending the protection of international humanitarian law, bringing, for instance, training of professional military legal advisors as a uh, regular attribute of most armed forces these days, the establishment of international tribunals, the extension of protection uh, in armed conflict also to areas of human rights law and other branches of law, and much other progress has been made. However, much remains to be done, and it does not appear likely that either war or violations of the law governing it will ever disappear, or at least not any time soon. But nevertheless, all governments and members of the armed forces have both a duty and an interest in promoting improved compliance with the law, both as a matter of principle, but also as a matter of enlightened self-interest. Since it's clear that a war fought in conformity with the rules will have more support from the public, from the international community, and will occasion less problems for the military forces themselves in actually conducting their operations. So from a strictly operational point of view, it makes sense to abide by the law. Despite all this, there are many or a number of current challenges, I can't go into all of them, which have emerged and deserve some special attention. These include the application of IHL to new technologies and weapons, the way in which IHL relates to other increasingly relevant bodies of international law and armed conflict, and providing for a coherent and workable application of them. And finally, the challenges posed by what is sometimes referred to as asymmetric warfare. In other words, a lack of reciprocity and equality between belligerents, which sometimes results in ignoring or shortcutting the legal obligations to be found in the law. Let me turn first to the challenges posed by new technologies, such as the use of armed drones, unmanned aerial vehicles, cyber weapons, autonomous weapons, and so forth. Some of these weapons are potentially capable of disrupting modern societies, bringing down uh, the fragile economic and social networks that we all depend upon now, and uh, making uh, the life, uh, economic life, social life, and so forth virtually impossible. Are these radically new developments? No. I would argue that previous centuries have seen similar far-reaching developments such as the emergence of industrialized warfare in the 19th century with its mass armies, ironclad battleships, vastly increased firepower, machine guns, and so forth, which resulted in the slaughter of the First World War on the battlefields of Europe and elsewhere. The development of nuclear weapons at the end of Second World War threatened the existence of society itself. Yet as the International Court of Justice correctly noted in its 